So uh, I want to give kind of a overview of natural hazards uh, in the north or cold lands. Uh, basically, floods, wildfires, earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, coastal erosion, and if I continue, you might think I'm crazy, but actually geomagnetic storms, solar flares, uh, and so on. But Russians appreciate craziness. I was meeting with MJS talking about natural hazards and the director of a major institute, MJS Institute, outside Moscow said, uh, we are making a big mistake. We have forgotten about asteroids. And Americans are shaking their heads. Uh, <coughs> crazy Russians. But what happens? A few months later, a, a huge, uh, well, small for asteroid, but 70 ton as asteroid comes in, enters the atmosphere over Chelyabinsk and explodes with a force of uh, one half megaton, injuring 1,600 people. So the MJS director is genius. Anyway, Sledeshi slide. Uh, a little bit about our sponsor. This is actually uh, called a peer-to-peer -peer program. The money comes from U.S. Embassy in uh, Moscow, so it's U.S. State Department, and it promotes dialogue between Russians and Americans on important non-political issues. Uh, sadly, there was much more cooperation especially at the government-to-government -government level um, uh, up until a couple years ago or less. Uh, but at least I'm, I'm glad that this still exists. So we have a, uh, a bilateral team of about a dozen people, half Russian and half Americans, and we're doing two case studies of villages that uh, suffered the same kind of natural disaster uh, flooding during a breakup of large rivers. Adetsi Saka Republic on the Lena River and Galena, Alaska on the Yukon River. Uh, there are of course many other uh, villages and even cities who have experienced that have experienced this problem, but um, this made sense because they are uh, villages similar in size, and uh, uh, the flooding took place at the same time. Uh, what we want to do is identify what works and what does not work to reduce the impact of these spring floods and share this information with our communities and governments. And I hope we can find a way to establish long-term communication and exchanges between both communities and also enhance the cooperation that's been going on between the university here and the university in Fairbanks for a long time. And also, as you probably know, we are sister cities and we would like to uh, uh, support that, that effort as, all, as well. It's standard practice in the field of natural hazards to try to draw on information from other regions and other countries because extreme events if you sit in one place you might only experience one extreme event in your lifetime or maybe none but if you talk to other people you can in other places you can get their experience and together identify what's the best thing to do slide so why I consider these kinds of natural 
hazards together. They are very different. A volcano <coughs> erupting is very different from a river flooding. But in fact, what a community has to do and what a government has to do is quite similar, regardless of the natural hazard. Uh, a community needs to know where the threat is, how often an event, a dangerous event, occurs, and how big it will be. Uh, a community needs to reduce its risk, uh, or usually called vulnerability, by in, in planning, siting facilities, uh, important ones that you can't live without. Uh, a hospital, a uh, uh, sewage treatment plant, a water plant is, in fact, as important as a private house is. Uh, those are more important because they are necessary for life in the community. So those need to be put in places that are safe, and if there's no safe place, there needs to be special engineering to protect them. Uh, the processes that give rise to disasters need to be monitored. And this can be with satellites, airplanes, surface instruments, or human observers, often all of those. And then if you understand something of the processes, you can, like weather, and floods, you can forecast, uh, and even volcanic eruptions, with both the observations and computer models, you can forecast these events. Can't do it for earthquakes, but at least in the case of earthquakes, you can say where are the most dangerous areas. So that helps. Uh, there has to be planning in advance, and we hear over and over again about wake-up calls. Uh, Katrina, the Katrina flood, New, York, New Orleans, United States, was a wake-up call about uh, natural hazards in the United States. And uh, uh, here, as I understand, the flooding of Lensk in 2001 was a wake-up call about floods. Wake-up call is an American expression. You're, you're asleep and something happens and you, you're suddenly awake and you say, oh my god, I should have been worried about this. Uh, <clears throat> and then education and communication. Everybody at all in, in society in a community needs to understand uh, what the problems are and what they need to do because communication in the middle of a crisis is difficult or impossible. So people already have to know something about what to expect and what to do about it. Next. Well, here's an example of the problem. Uh, Japan is by far the most advanced country in the world in terms of dealing with earthquakes and tsunamis. And this was a survey that was done after the Tohoku earthquake of 2011, where about 20,000 people died. And 17,000 of those people were killed by a tsunami. Now a tsunami is something, in this case, they had about 30 minutes to get to high ground, and, and the coastal zone is, is narrow, so there should have been time for people to get out of the way. But you can see uh, on the pie chart on the left, half the, despite all kinds of advanced uh, plans to warn people, only half the people found out there was a tsunami coming. Uh, and in fact, the forecast was bad. It, it, uh, it under forecast the tsunami by a factor of three 
The forecast was for a three meter tsunami. The real tsunami was over 10 meters. Uh, then, what were people doing when the tsunami hit? Well, a third of them had managed to get to a higher place, and that's what everybody should have done. Twenty, a quarter of them went to check on family members. Well, that, that is something that all the government communication says, don't, don't look for family members go to a high place. Your family members will also go to a high place. If you go looking for them, you will get killed. Uh, but of course, you're in a crisis, you think, oh, where's my child? I've got to find my child. Uh, and then other people were cleaning their rooms, chattering, I guess that's Japanese English, they were conversant. Well, they weren't on their cell phones because this, None of the cell phones were. Uh, they were getting ready to evacuate. Five percent of the people actually went towards the shore to watch the tsunami. Uh, not very many of them survived. So even in a very well prepared country, there are, are huge problems. Next. So. What are some characteristics of this? One is that these extreme events only cause disasters when people and property are in the way. Uh, some places you can have a tsunami or a volcanic eruption. Nobody cares because nobody got killed, um, no damage to anything. So it's people and property in the way that are really the problem. Uh, but there are compelling reasons to live certain dangerous places, like next to the ocean so you can fish. So people tolerate that kind of risk because their life depends on it. Uh, it's human nature that most of the preparation for disasters occurs after a disaster. This is unfortunate, but it's human nature because people forget about these things and there are lots of ways to spend money and nobody wants to spend money uh, for something that might not happen. And, uh, but then when it happens, people say, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. So they scurry around and do a whole bunch of stuff. They build dams or uh, uh, monitoring systems or something, and and then kind of forget about it again. Uh, the farther apart these events are, the worse this problem is. So, for example, in Seattle, there was a huge uh, earthquake in 1700, uh, 315 years ago that caused such a big tsunami that it killed people in Japan. And uh, it's hard to get people interested in this problem, even though the time between uh, uh, events like that is 300 years. Well, 300 years is up. It could happen tomorrow again, or it could happen 100 years from now. But it will happen. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> now with floods, uh, they tend to happen quite often, um, so it's maybe a little bit easier there to get people's attention about it. And that's, that's another thing. Extreme events have recurrence intervals of years, centuries, or millennia, thousand years, and, and government budgets have are, are made every year. So uh, it's hard to it's hard to put money in in an annual budget for something that occurs once every thousand years. And as I mentioned before, one very important thing is to learn from all these events and 
the way to do that is to share because every event like this is a lesson and if you share information you have more lessons next uh, I also mentioned this is kind of about sharing in the context of University of the Arctic. Uh, this university and our university are both very active in that, and so it lends itself to this kind of sharing of science and uh, uh, cultural uh, information, arts, and so on. It's really a very powerful thing, and I think without the existence of this in a a thematic network, as we call it, on natural hazards, it's much less likely that we could have come together, this university and ours, on this project. Next. Well, this is very crude, but just to give you a, a drawing in the early hours of this morning, but just to give you a rough idea, you can think of natural events in terms of how big their impact is on uh, human society and what the recurrence interval is, how frequent they are, what, what's the timing between events. And uh, so over on the right, time between events might be a thousand years and this would be a few years. And on the vertical scale, right at the top would be total destruction, nothing left. And uh, down here, maybe just mild damage. And in between, a lot of damage, but you've got something left to build on. There's nothing left in the tsunami zone in Japan. Absolutely nothing higher than about that. <coughs> Next. Uh, so, natural hazards occur all over the world. How are they different in cold lands? Well, some are unique to cold lands. Uh, or those involving ice, like what we're concerned with, ice jam floods, coastal erosion during, due to changes in sea ice and permafrost, and I'll get to at the end, magnetic storms are more intense at high latitude. Uh, you probably haven't worried about magnetic storms before so I'm, I'm giving you something new to worry about. <laughs> <It's me too. clears throat> uh, others are modified by the presence of ice. For example, if you have a lot of ice on a volcano, even a small eruption can cause a devastating flood. Uh, some are really not much affected by surface conditions, earthquakes, for example. Although if the ground is frozen, probably the shaking is going to be different. Um, but one thing that the North uh, differs from most of the rest of the world is that the uh, emergency response is impacted, it is delayed by remoteness. Help has to come from a long way away. Uh, by the cold, it's hard to deliver medical aid in the cold, and by the darkness. And if you have an earth, a major earthquake in the middle of winter, and it's very cold, there's very little time to rescue the survivors. Whereas in a normal part of the world, you might have a week to pull people out of buildings uh, at minus 40, you wouldn't have much time at all. Next. So any community has choices when they know what their hazards are. They can move. And here, Belgies, Alaska in 1964 was completely destroyed by a tsunami. So they put it someplace else on higher ground. You can protect it. And this is going on in Petropavlos Kamchatsky a hugely expensive project reinforcing all the apartment buildings, basically encasing them in uh, steel 
Or you can do what Anchorage, Alaska did, is to just ignore it. And uh, <clears throat> Paul Anglisky, Whistle by the Graveyard. Uh, <clears throat> and there you see, they just rebuilt uh, in place. And uh, chances are they'll get away with it. Well, maybe not. Uh, I mean, they'll get away with it for, might get away with it for the next 100 years. Next. One thing is that we hear in Alaska a lot of preaching about small rural communities being uh, uh, self uh, 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 sustainable or even it sounds a little offensive self reliant as if the, these communities have their hands out all the time. The fact is that even the biggest communities need help in a disaster. And uh, here is a very large storm hit uh, New York and New Jersey, and they were expecting uh, emergency funds from the federal government. And uh, one very bad political party uh, <laughs> blocked it. Uh, you can you can see. <clears throat> Next. Uh, so I'm going to give you some examples of some disasters in the north. Next. Well, starting with the one we're looking at, that we're, we're studying in this project, and you, you can see the similarity here, the date C, uh, May 2013, and Galena. May 2013, and to Yara uh, made a list of the events. You see, these things are very frequent, and uh, I'm in a date sea, and I imagine if you totaled that up, the cost would be absolutely enormous. Uh, it would be equivalent to a, a pretty big disaster. But people so far tolerate that uh, kind, of, kind of situation. And likewise for Galena, uh, uh, but uh, they, it had been, been quite a while before since they've had anything like this. Next. So they're, free, they're relatively frequent as natural disasters go. Uh, they destroy homes and livelihood. Again, the dates see on the left, Galena on the right, there's the water level during the flood inside the house that was abandoned. Next. Uh, floods often require long-term evacuation, which is damaging to the community in itself because people begin to leave, lose the community ties because they have to live someplace else and begin to form new ties where they live, because you have to have that. So if they're evacuated for a long time, they may never come back. It, the community can be destroyed that way. Next. Uh, there's also a serious problem in Alaska. The, the uh, rural villages, have, each has its own power supply, its own sewage system, its own uh, uh, water system, and these get uh, frequently uh, damaged or destroyed in floods. The result is that some of these uh, villages have very high rates of disease that you don't normally find in the United States that are, uh, or probably Russia, uh, that are, are due to insufficient uh, water, uh, bad sanitation, and so on. Next. Uh, well, but it's not just rural villages. Ma major infrastructure can be damaged as well. This is the one road to the uh, huge oil field on the north slope of Alaska. Uh, cut. Uh, during uh, 
uh, spring breakup by a flood. And so the only way to get people and supplies in and out uh, of, the, of this vast oil field was by uh, airplane. It was really kind of a dangerous situation if something had also happened, if there happened to be some industrial accident at the oil field as well. Next. Uh, the wake-up call in Fairbanks happened in 1967, and uh, there was a big uh, dam was built, levees, and an area that can collect water. And I think probably everybody in Fairbanks would say this will never happen again. It's probably not true. There are other ways that Fairbanks could flood, but uh, uh, it it helps. Next. Uh, <clears throat> wildland fires are a really big deal, both in uh, Alaska and in Russia. And I keep comparing Alaska and Russia because the United States is pretty far south. It's far, the main part of the United States is south of most of Russia. Uh, Alaska is the only cold land part of the United States, and it has a pretty small population, but it has a lot in common with Russia, much more so than it does with the rest of the U.S. So we have the same huge problem with uh, wildfires, not just, uh, not just the, the health problem, uh, but uh, the threat to uh, villages and even, uh, even cities, and uh, Sharon's village was, was affected just this last summer, I guess, by a huge wildfire. Next. And here's why the problem is so big. It's the vast, boreal forest. You can't fight those fires, and it wouldn't be a good idea to do that. They're part of the ecology of the, uh, of, of the cold lands. Um, but they are, the, the, the fire, although it's a natural occurrence, is a big hazard to humans. Next. Uh, and these are a hazard to uh, cities as well. It's pretty scary in Fairbanks when these things are close. Next. Thawing of permafrost. Uh, now, here's a happy tale. Uh, you can't bury a pipeline where there's permafrost because the oil is warm and it will melt the permafrost and then the pipeline loses its support and you'll have a, a mess. Uh, when the pipeline was being built in the 70s, the oil companies originally wanted to just bury the pipeline. And it took a lot of uh, heat flow calculations to convince them that they'd lose their pipeline very quickly. So a very expensive uh, engineered protection was made. These are, the, it stands on legs that are self-refrigerating and they keep, uh, they keep the ground frozen underneath the pipe. Next. And this is another successful story. Again, the oil companies weren't so excited about uh, protecting uh, the pipeline from earthquakes. Geologists knew there was a big fault that went across underneath the pipeline. And uh, of course, it would have been a, a fairly safe bet to ignore it. The consequences of the pipeline rupturing would have been severe. In fact, it might not even be possible to get the pipeline going again. So finally, the geologists convinced the oil companies to put the pipe on, on tracks so it could slide and also make it kind of like, you know, back and forth so it could extend like that 
And they estimated the worst case event would be a magnitude 7.9 with a displacement, a horizontal displacement of about seven meters, which is huge. You can imagine what would th that would do to an unprotected pipe. And that's exactly what they got was the worst possible case in 2002, I think it was, and near uh, its gotcha. <laughs> it was so strong that they, the trees were whipping back and forth and hitting the ground on both sides. Uh, but a happy tale, uh, it, it came, it was designed so it could lose two supports without failing, and it, it lost two and almost lost the third. Next. Uh, <clears throat> well, earthquakes, they're the same as at the equator, but uh, in general, there, it's a much longer distance to help, and it's a much shorter time for rescue. Uh, God help us if we have a big earthquake in Fairbanks and we lose power uh, when it's minus 40. Uh, I think we are not toast, but frozen. Next. Uh, same for tsunamis. Uh, they occur everywhere, but again, uh, and they are a big risk both on the east coast of Russia and uh, on the coast of Alaska. Uh, this one in 1952 killed uh, about 3,000 people. Tsunamis are not just one wave and the people felt the earthquake, they left their village, went up on the hillside, uh, saw this first wave come in and uh, they thought that was it. They went back down to the village and the next one was bigger and killed everyone. Next. Uh, this is one you might not have heard of, but it's, it's also only in cold lands, mountainous cold lands. It's, it's quite a worry in Norway, in the fjords. These are glacial valleys, they may be a thousand meters deep. And during the ice age, they were filled with ice, which put pressure on the walls, but now the ice is gone. And there's nothing pushing back on those walls, so about twice a century, they lose a town. So the Norwegians are starting to monitor find out where there are cracks and monitor those for uh, any motion. Next. Volcanic eruptions. Uh, <clears throat> in Alaska, one in 1912, uh, destroyed two native villages, and uh, which were never reoccupied. Next. Uh, much smaller eruptions can cause problems, though. Uh, that Katmai was the biggest eruption on Earth in 200 years. But uh, uh, a fairly small eruption, eruptions, a Riga volcano near Anchorage have twice almost uh, destroyed a, uh, a tank farm where a lot of oil is stored right next to Cook Inlet, which would be quite a disaster to dump an enormous amount of oil into Cook Inlet. This is an example of people doing stupid things. Uh, they, the oil company selected um, a nice flat area uh, to build their facility on. The reason why it's a not nice flat area is that every 20 or 30 years, it gets kind of paved. A huge amount of debris comes down from the volcano and just kind of makes a nice surface. Uh, <clears throat> next. And there's some, there's some strange thing. Not all the debris flows are fast. There are, are creeping ones, for example, ones that are creeping toward the uh, pipeline. Uh, next. 
Well, yes, save the best for last. Very scary stuff. Uh, <clears throat> solar flares, ejection of coronal mass toward the Earth, uh, and the lines of magnetic force uh, on the Earth converge at the poles. So all these particles come in, and they get channeled down toward the poles, and they uh, north and south pole, but nobody lives at the south pole. But they endure, induce electrical currents in pipelines and uh, communication systems and so on. So uh, there was a huge event in 1859, but there wasn't much electrical infrastructure then, just telegraphs, which were, many were destroyed. Uh, now there's a lot, there's a lot. They will, uh, you can blow up uh, power transformers and things like that. A very bad, a very bad thing when it's cold. And a long time to recover. Next. <laughs> so, scared yet? Well, uh, in fact, big disasters are no more likely than uh, uh, for for an individual person than an uh, accident or a disease. And and just like accidents and diseases, there are things we can do to uh, reduce our risk. Drive carefully. Wear a seat belt. Wash your hands. Uh, things like that. Uh, for a community, however, a community has a, a, a longer life expectancy, so it's a, more, it's a more serious thing for a community. If you have 1% of a bad event per year, and you want your community to last 100 years, you need to do, you need to do something about it. And I think that's my last Oh, well, that was the last slide. Uh, this is what the Japanese call a, a levy, or, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's just an extra slide. Some things are so expensive that uh, it's questionable whether, whether you should do that. But this is a, another case of uh, they had a wall to prevent tsunamis. It wasn't high enough, so it did absolutely no good. So now they have a wall that would prevent tsunamis, but the next one will be about a thousand years from now. So that's the way it goes. Anyway, thanks. Any any questions? <laughs>